resulted for an extra, extra effort to put it together a program that is inspiring and gives life. And uh, let me offer a location prior to our lecture. How do you say, Father? We're gathered here together. Father, with our brothers and sisters, 43 of you out there in the world, and us here together, Father. We're praying for your presence with us. We pray your guidance within our lecture today. Father, bless this moment so we can come closer to you, so we can understand, Father, your lonely heart as you search, Father, for our family, for your family, Father, to come together in unity and harmony as you desired from the beginning. Father, bless us today. Bless us, this community of faith that's growing every day, Father, under the ministry of our pastor, Reverend Yanjin Moon, and our beloved brothers and sisters here, Father, leading this effort, Coach and M and their families. We pray that together we can give hope, real hope, Father, for this world. We thank you and ask your blessing upon this lecture today. In the name of Lourdes and Rick for the Swartz family and all of our families here, Aju. Aju. So let's welcome Carrie Williams. Thank you. <coughs> Hi, good afternoon everyone. It's a, it's a real privilege to be able to uh, stand in front of you today and share this wonderful uh, lecture, The Purpose of the Messiah. So today we're going to talk about the purpose um, of how we get delivered from evil through the coming of the Savior. So why do we need the Messiah? Well, as we have discussed um, in our first lecture, that the purpose of our life, the original position that God created us to be in was as a child of God. Each person is created to be the dwelling place of God and is to be able to fulfill the three blessings to express true love in all the essential relationships of life. And God wanted to establish this through the first human ancestors, Adam and Eve. He gave them but one commandment, and it was their responsibility to obey God's word. Had they done so, they would have eventually perfected their character centered upon God and been blessed by God in marriage. This would have been a glorious day, brothers and sisters. It would have been a day of explosion with joy. God would have been so happy to be dwelling within his son, Adam, the body of God, make love to his bride, Eve, God's lineage, God's presence, would have been forever manifested on the earth. Our first parents would have become true parents. They would have passed on divine love, life, and lineage to make an ideal world. But as we know, this did not happen. At the beginning of human history, Adam and Eve betrayed God. We know now through the revelation of the Reverend Son Myung Moon, that Adam and Eve engaged in premature sexual love with the angel, Archangel Lucifer, and then Eve having experienced, having her eyes opened, knowing that Adam was to be her true spouse, then multiplied this premature love to Adam. And in this manner, Satan became the false father of humankind. Jesus said in John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil. The tragedy is that Satan became the false father of humankind and Adam and Eve became false parents themselves. We need to know that our fallen condition is a source of heartbreak for God and misery for us. God is not some far-off, distant being sitting on a throne looking down at humankind. God is miserable. 
along with the misery of humankind. So much so that in the book of Genesis 6, 6, God even regretted that he made humankind. So the deep-rooted nature of evil is such is that we have no easy way out without intervention. Thus, we have the need for salvation. And divine principle teaches that salvation is not just getting forgiven, but it's actually restoration, being restored back to the state that we were at before the fall occur, occurred. And we see that the purpose and direction of history, the story told in this good book, is nothing other than the restoration of humankind through the Messiah, so that we can become restored Adam and Eve and we can fulfill the three blessings. The Bible is the record of salvation history. And it's through the Bible that we study God's effort to restore, to save humankind, to return them to his caring dominion. And this is prophesied. God promises that they shall beat their swords into plowshares. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. And in Revelations, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men. This concept of an ideal world has permeated human consciousness in the Bible and throughout human history. The central focus then of this process of restoration involves the appearance of a special individual who becomes the first person to fulfill God's plan for humankind. And we Christians call this individual the Messiah or the Savior. Now is this concept unique to Judaism or Christianity? Absolutely not. There are many different terms that have been used to describe the mission of this individual, but I maintain that they are all referring to essentially the same task. The central terminology and description of Savior is from Judaism, who awaited the coming of the Mashiach, the Messiah, for 4,000 years. <clears throat> In Christianity, we know Christ as the Savior as the Christ. In Buddhism, the awaiting of the Buddha or the enlightened one, Jesus is called the second Adam, the son of God. The Quran prophesies that Muhammad is the last prophet who will come to bring salvation. Hinduism predicts the coming of the avatar, the incarnation of deity on earth. Confucianism talks about the true man, the chunsi. And incarnation is a word that is used, uh, not just in Christianity, but it was used as far back as ancient Egypt. The pharaohs were considered incarnations of sun gods. In Christianity, we understand that the Messiah comes as the new Adam. That he pioneers the way to defeat Satan personally and realize the, through the three blessings. To do this, he must restore a woman as his bride. Together, they become the true parents. And once the true parents are established, they can begin the process of restoring the rest of humankind. Now, I'd like to take a minute and dwell on this diagram here because this diagram has kind of come to life in a much more vivid way in the past several years. Okay, 1 Timothy 2.5 says that there is one God and one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. I have a question for you. When Mary was um, visited by the archangel Gabriel, how did he 
tell her that she would, conce he, she would conceive the Christ child? The Holy By the Holy Spirit. He said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of Of God. Brothers and sisters, the statement that Christ was conceived by the Holy Spirit means that Christ was fathered by God. He was the second Adam. Who was the first Adam's father? God. <laughs> Who? Satan has no ability to create, let's be clear. Adam was created with the invisible God as his father, and so Jesus, as the second Adam, was fathered by God. 1 John 3, 9, everyone who has been fathered by God does not practice sin, because God's seed resides in him, and thus he is not able to sin, because he has been fathered by God. And Reverend Moon has brought 1 John 3, 9 in high definition when he says, for complete restoration, the starting, port, the starting point is the seed which exists in the body of the male. The condition must be established in which the seed within the male is united with God's love. This teaching is founded on the Bible, which is God's word. So we can understand clearly that the Messiah comes from the seed, from the lineage of God. Our salvation is more than forgiveness. It involves our restoration, our recreation as true children of God. Free from original sin, with the same position and status of Adam and Eve before the fall. Let's be clear, what is the purpose of salvation? What does it mean to be completely restored? We have no more the same position and status of Adam and Eve before the fall. Let's be clear, what is the purpose of salvation? What does it mean to be completely restored? We have no more sin. We are perfected in heart. We don't need a religious life anymore. We're living with God every moment of every day. Our children are born free of original sin. And we no longer have need for the Messiah. So <clears throat> let's think about this. God is primarily, he's not a theologian. God is our parent. God is our father. Isn't this what he wants for us? Is this being heretical or sacrilegious? To think that this is the destiny? of humankind? If you are a parent, and I believe everyone in here in the room is, would you desire for your children to continually coming to you, apologizing for how they messed up once again, how they are spending their lives torn between good and evil? Does this make you happy? No. You just want your children to be happy, to live according to their heart, to make a beautiful family, to live a life of goodness. If we desire this for our own children, how much more God must desire this for us? Now, did Jesus come as the Messiah? 
Christianity definitely believes that the Messiah has already come. My beloved father, who may have changed his mind, he is now in spirit world. He was raised Jewish. He said to me, you think Jesus has come again. I'm still waiting. <laughs> so not everybody believes that Jesus has come as a Messiah. Well, <clears throat> 2,000 years ago, in the Middle East, in a very tiny colony of the great Roman Empire, one man changed human history to an extent that no person has ever done before or since. Normally, when someone dies, their impact on the world immediately begins to recede. How much do you remember Nelson Rockefeller? I remember when Reverend Moon spoke after Nelson Rockefeller died and said, Nelson Rockefeller died recently. He didn't comment directly, as I recall, but he said, to the degree that someone lives for the sake of God, lives for the sake of the world, lives for the sake of heaven, to that degree they will be remembered. <clears throat> if someone's legacy outlasts their life, it's usually apparent when they die. On the day Alexander the Great, Napoleon, Socrates, or even Muhammad died, their reputation was immense. What about when Jesus died? Tiny, failed movement. Twelve scruffy disciples, one of them betrayed him. His life and his movement seemed clearly at an end. But what about the impact of Jesus? One hundred years after he died, he had a greater impact than when he was alive. 500 years, even greater. 1,000 years, he laid the legacy for much of Europe. And 2,000 years, he has more followers than ever. His life and teachings simply drew people to follow him. He did not praise himself. He praised his Father on high. He made history by starting in a humble place with the pure spirit of one who is a total, complete reflection of the love of God. The principle affirms that Jesus came in the role of the Messiah. Becoming spiritually mature, he realized the first blessing and was morally perfected. He was a man of true love, and in his being and actions, he was a manifestation of God and true human nature. Jesus came from the seed of God, containing the unfallen lineage of our Heavenly Father. He set a stirring example of living for others, yet in his own time, he was rejected by everyone, even his own family. Now, here we see the example of Jesus with a child. In the time of ancient Rome, when Jesus lived, the time of Augustus Caesar, it's important to know how children were thought of. In the Roman Empire, many babies did not grow up at all. In the ancient world, unwanted children were often simply left to die, a practice called exposure. The head of the household had the legal right to decide the life or death of other members of the family. This decision was usually made during the first eight or so days of life. In fact, children were not named until the eighth day because they often would be left uh, to die. They could be drowned, uh, disposed of. Plutarch um, said that until that time, the child, until the eighth day, the child was more like a plant than a human being. Abandoned children were often left on a dump or a dunghill. Now, I'm not saying that ancient parents could be tender and loving. They could be. But children had value to the extent that they could serve the state. And the state was embodied by Herod. In themselves, children were disposable. So what changed this attitude towards children? 
Mark 10, 13 through 16. <clears throat> One day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was angry with his disciples. He said to them, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like the children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms and placed his hands on their heads and blessed them. The customs for ch against treating children changed because a group of people remembered that they were followers of a man who said, let the little children come unto me. Jesus had the potential to realize the ideal world. He brought a new expression of truth, as I just demonstrated with his attitude towards children. You know, we take that for granted in our American society, though in some ways it has changed. But still, this attitude that we have that children have inherent value came from none other than Jesus Christ. Jesus brought a new expression of truth. Now, we maintain Jesus told us he had much more to share than we could bear. But he shared revolutionary teaching during his lifetime with authority. And people were so impressed with the authority with which he spoke. He talked about the personal nature of God as our loving father, not as a remote king. The ancient Jews, the Jews of Israel, they loved God. Don't get me wrong. They loved Yahweh. But they feared him. They would not speak his name because it was too powerful, too great. Jesus was the first person who referred to God as Appa. And he not only spoke about this love, he shared this love with everyone he came into contact with. There are so many examples of Jesus' unconditional love. Here, the famous story of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. We can call Jesus an upside-down king. Think about Caesar Augustus. Worship me, it's fine. He allowed himself to be worshipped as a god. What did Jesus do? What did Jesus say? He said, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. <clears throat> love your enemies. He said, anybody can love their friends, but loving your enemies, do good to those who hate you. As a man close to God's heart, Jesus of Nazareth also had the ability to forgive sin on God's behalf. <clears throat> Famous illustration is Jesus' forgiveness of a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. What was the um, punishment for adultery back in the time of Jesus? Stone. Stone to death. Hard to believe now, but it was of a Stone to death. Hard to believe now, but it was of a... woman who had committed adultery. So he proclaimed her pardon in defiance of a crowd who was prepared to execute her according to the law. He said in effect by his actions, I am above the law. 
I'm not going to abide by the rules that say she should be stoned to death. And then he challenged the crowd around her to say, hey, those of you who are without sin, go ahead, cast the first stone. And so what happened? They, they walked away one by one. Jesus got them to look into their own hearts. And then he said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. Brothers and sisters, Jesus had the confidence to forgive sin while he was alive. His power was derived from his special position as God's son. <clears throat> and Jesus announced the ideal world. In fact, the majority of scholars today recognize Jesus' announcement of the imminent coming of God's kingdom as the major trademark of his ministry. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He prayed, he asked his disciples to pray this prayer every day. It becomes clear when we see that Jesus actually never preached to the large crowds that it was his destiny to go to the cross. That was, message was given in the last year of his ministry to his disciples privately. But his overwhelming message was the coming of the kingdom. This is illustrated beautifully in the book, Luke of, uh, sorry, in the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 18. Jesus goes to the and saying that only the path of truth is the true path. In China, Confucius taught that the family is the basis for the ideal government. Lao Tzu in China taught what we call Taoism, which emphasized the three treasures of compassion, simplicity, and humility. Buddha in India taught the four noble truths by which we could attain nirvana. Socrates in Greece, who was one of the founders of Western philosophy, brought a new level of intellectuality to the people of Greece. And of course, Israel, where Jesus appeared, had been practicing the Ten Commandments. They were people of the word. In the desert, what was the central, most important thing that they took with them in their journey to Canaan? The Ark of the Covenant. Do you know that when they camped, there was a very, very specific pattern by which they had the Ark of the Covenant in the middle, the tabernacle. in the middle, and all the tribes camped around it in a very specific patterns. What was that for? That was to teach them that the word is central. And who was the word made flesh? The coming of Christ. So we can see that providence had prepared the world environment of that time to enable Jesus' message to quickly re reach key civilizations. Brothers and sisters, I'm not for one minute saying that we cannot attain salvation through the death and resurrection of Jesus. 
But we have to ask ourselves, in light of this preparation, was this God's primary will for Jesus Christ? He died as a state-executed criminal, unknown and unloved, rejected by his people. Though he came as a Messiah, an ideal world never came about. And as I just asked you, was Jesus' death on the cross necessary? Was it God's primary will that the sinless Son of God should shed his blood on the cross as a means by which we could attain salvation? For 2,000 years, millions of believers in the Christian tradition have understood the story and meaning of the life and death of Jesus in certain established ways. And let me say to you, I am not here to argue with the root of Christianity. But what I want to talk to you about in light of this age that we are living in now, what is the fruit of Christianity? What can we learn from the life of Jesus, from the blood of Jesus that can bring us into the completed testament age? Traditional understanding of Jesus' purpose was he was supposed to die on the cross. The salvation of believers comes only through Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, <clears throat> let me add, there is a lot of reason to actually believe that Jesus came to die on the cross. <clears throat> if you read the whole Bible, you will read many such passages as in Isaiah 53. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Must we not admit that this fits with the life of Jesus, of what actually transpired? There are approximately 350 prophecies of the coming of Christ in the Old Testament. Many of them prophesy suffering. So we cannot lightly say, oh, Jesus didn't come to die. We have to honor Christians who are really sincerely trying to understand the meaning of the death of their Savior. <clears throat> We believe that God prepared the nation of Israel to receive the Messiah. It is well established that Israel had been specially prepared over hundreds of years to expect a Messiah. Through their training to strictly revere the temple, I talked to you about the tabernacle existing um, <clears throat> In, in the uh, wilderness, and all of the tribes would camp around it. This was all preparation for attending the Lord when he came. <clears throat> Let's look at the way that Jesus' disciples responded when he was crucified. If it was God's primary will for Jesus to be crucified... Wouldn't they have been happy? Now, they may have personally been sad because they lost their ability to have give and take with their Messiah in the physical world. But if this was God's predestined plan from the beginning of time, then they should have rejoiced. Well, <clears throat> let's look at what St. Stephen said. The dying words of St. Stephen, one of Jesus' most loyal disciples, clearly shows he did not view the crucifixion as God's will. He saw this as a crime against God. He said, you are just like your fathers who killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. If one of Jesus' closest disciples felt this way, it's highly probable that others did well, that others did as well. <clears throat> what about Judas? 
Judas was the one who carried out the plan for some silver. Was he rejoicing that he had accomplished his God-ordained mission? No. He hung himself. Tragically. Jesus' words are perhaps the most powerful testimony that his primary mission was not to go the way of the cross. John 6, 29. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Why would he say this if he could only truly help them after his future death? Also, Jesus had authority from God to forgive sins. And in my studies of the New Testament, of the Old Testament, which I've been doing in earnest now for the last several years, I have come to understand one of the main problems the Pharisees had with Jesus was that he said he had the authority to forgive sins. You think about it, what did Jesus actually establish in his lifetime? Did he make the Jesus school so you can come study the teachings of Jesus? Did he make a business, any organizations? No. It was what he said. It was how he presented himself that caused him to be crucified. And the crown of thorns is evidence. It was clear that he considered himself to be the king of kings because they call it hostile testimony. The hostile testimony of the people that made those, that crown of thorns. Oh, here is your king, O Israel. It was clear to people that Jesus considered himself to have a special position and to have the authority of God. Now, did the people believe Jesus? No. That's why he said in John 10, 38, well, if you don't believe in what I say, then believe in the miracles that you may learn, that I am in the Father. Are these the words of a man whose original plan is to be rejected and die? Jesus at one point in his ministry even wept over Jerusalem. He said, if you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will dash you to the ground because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I have longed to gather your children together, but you were not willing. Why would he try so hard if it was a lost cause from the beginning? Why be upset if it was God's will for people to reject him, if it was in fact a necessity in order to save the world? If we look at the stages of Jesus' public work, we find three distinct phases. Throughout the first period, he preached God's kingdom on earth and demonstrated its possibility. As his message spread, the Nazarene gradually came to face dangerous opposition from the very leaders God had prepared to receive him. As a result of this opposition, Jesus began to recognize the likelihood of his going to the cross. And then in the final stage of his ministry, he began to speak of his death and the need for a second coming of the Messiah. <clears throat> it's very important when you study the divine principle that you study, that you start work first with the principle of creation. Because I have come to understand that perhaps the most precious gift God gave to human beings was their portion of responsibility. That's how we become kings and queens ourselves, because we participate in our own creation. And for Jesus' mission to be accomplished, it required our human responsibility. 
God does 95%. How much did God have to go through to send Jesus? Have you read the Old Testament? It is a rough ride. <laughs> that Old Testament, oh my goodness. What God had to go through to prepare that nation of Israel. It's miserable. But he did. And he sent Jesus. And then what's our 5%? Believe. So you may say, compared to what God went through, not so much, but still it's critical. 95 plus 5 equals 100. 100 equals success. Okay, the people's portion of responsibility was to accept Jesus Christ. And <clears throat> we see throughout the Old Testament a dual prophecy. You see Jesus <clears throat> uh, Christ proclaimed as the victorious Messiah who will build um, <clears throat> the nation of God and will continue the Davidic kingdom. You also see the prophecy of the suffering Lord. In fact, another reason why many of the Jewish leaders could not accept Jesus was because they said, Where, where's the kingdom? You, you promised us the kingdom. Where's the kingdom? So we can see that God never changes. God, you can count on God 24-7. But human beings, we're kind of scary. If you really think about it. God doesn't know. He, he always hopes for the best. He believes in us. He trusts us, even when we don't deserve his trust. But... Finally, it's our decision whether we accept the risen Lord or we reject him. So God did not know. And that is why you see this dual prophecy in the Old Testament. So now let's talk about what was the significance of Jesus' sacrifice. Through the crucifixion, Jesus' precious physical self was given over to Satan. The evil force worked through sinful and ignorant men to destroy Jesus' body. Satan, however, was unable to defeat the Messiah's spirit. When Jesus was hanging on that cross, nailed there by the very people he had come to save, and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I believe an electric jolt was sent to Heavenly Father. Oh my goodness! Someone who has my heart in the midst of this terrible suffering. The heart of Jesus was 100% the heart of God based on Jesus' absolute faith, absolute love, and absolute obedience to God, the resurrection could take place. Now God could work directly through his perfected son in the spiritual world who completely embodied God's word. And those who believe in Jesus as a Messiah, who receive the body and the blood of Christ symbolically, through Holy Communion, they could share now in his fate. However, our physical self still remains under Satan's do dominion. Even Paul, perhaps the greatest disciple of Jesus, said, wretched man that I am who will save me from this body of death. We still await for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So even after the coming of Christ on the physical realm, there is still struggle. Our restoration is still incomplete. So as believers of Christ, do we still have sin? Are we perfected in heart? Do we still need religious life? Do children still have to be baptized? Every good Christian needs to be baptized. My children all went to Catholic school on the 
application form, baptism date. When did you have your child baptized? Very important. The symbolic removing of original sin still has to take place. And the Christians are awaiting the Messiah to return. Okay, so I've been talking for a while. Do you need a quick break before we go into chapter part two? Okay, Yarmouth says no, keep going. All right. Why did Jesus die? Our final section deals with these questions, this question. So, okay, if it was not God's original will for Jesus to go the way of the cross, how could this have happened? It was God's will, as we've said, that the people should recognize and accept the Messiah. If the people had recognized the Messiah, they would not have killed him. <clears throat> God had a practical plan. Do you know that God is a planner? He's a strategist. God had a practical plan to prepare his nation to recognize the Messiah. Throughout Israel's history, God always worked through central figures, often prophets, to reveal his will. The people, in turn, were expected to obey and follow the central person as a representative of God. This pattern of leadership was for the specific purpose of training them to follow the Messiah and to prevent mistakes. Thus, the expectation of the Messiah was accompanied by an expectation that a special individual or prophet would come in advance to lead the people to him. And who was that person? Jesus. Who was the person that was supposed to appear to proclaim him? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Is this just something that we just thought up, we just decided? No. God gave us everything we needed to know. In the last book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, it is written, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that day of the Lord comes. So, the learned people of Israel, before they saw the Messiah, they were asking, where is Elijah? Who was Elijah anyway? He was, from the Old Testament, one of the boldest of the prophets. He, his name itself means, my God is Yahweh. He opposed the false god Baal. And he urged the people of Israel to turn from sin and to return to the true God. So, are we saying that Elijah was supposed to be reincarnated? Do we believe in reincarnation? No. But someone with the spirit and mission of Elijah was supposed to come to turn people away from sin and to return them to the true God who was embodied in his son, Jesus Christ. And as you have so correctly stated, at the time of Jesus, there was an influential person by the name of John the Baptist. He was a passionate preacher and teacher. He warned the people to repent, change their lives in anticipation of the Messiah's ar arrival. Everyday multitudes would come to him to be purified in the bathing ritual called baptism. He was not part of the religious establishment though he was the son of a priest and lived an exemplary life of purity and poverty. And he was extraordinarily popular. You might call him the Billy Graham of ancient Israel. He was someone who was beloved and respected by the people of Israel. In fact, so many people respected John, they thought maybe he might be Christ. And even Herod, the corrupt king Herod, feared him and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. Um, and in the New Testament, it confirms that John the Baptist was to go forth with the spirit and power of Elijah. An angel told Zechariah, Luke 1.17, that John would go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So the spirit of Elijah was working with John 
to fulfill the mission of leading the people to the Messiah. So God's plan for restoration depended on John the Baptist. You think about it, doesn't that make sense if God is planning? If God has a central person, if John the Baptist, Billy Graham gets on television, he's kind of old now, but um, maybe Franklin Graham, were to say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want you all to know that Reverend Sung Young Moon is the Lord of the Second Advent. Or maybe the Pope, who, I know the Pope, anyway, I won't go there. What if the Pope got on television? You know, spoke in St. Basilica. Reverend Moon is the Lord of the Second Advent. A lot of people would accept that. Just because of how much they respect the Pope, of how much they respect Billy, Billy Graham. It's a lot easier than having to go to each and every person individually and convince them. So God is a strategist. He planned for John the Baptist to be the link between the masses and the unknown Messiah when he came. And, and uh, Jesus confirms John is the Elijah who was to come. <clears throat> and then he said, Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him which is a bit troubling. What does this mean? They didn't recognize Elijah. Then the disciples understood he was talking to them about John the Baptist. Now, there is testimony where John recognizes Jesus as a Messiah. At the outset of Jesus' public ministry, the young Messiah approached John, his cousin, in order to be baptized. What does John do? He's like, no, no, I, I, you, know, you should baptize me. I'm, I'm unworthy to, to tie your sandals. But Jesus insists. And so at the moment John baptizes Jesus, he hears a voice from heaven. This is my son whom I love, with whom I am well, with, with him I am well pleased. He then loudly proclaims the arrival of the Son of God. Wow, Jesus' heart must have leapt. He proclaimed me. Elijah has spoken through John the Baptist. But I have a question for you. Where else does John testify? He doesn't testify anywhere else. In truth, John's, <clears throat> God's plan was frustrated. John did not become Jesus' most powerful ally and disciple. Quite the contrary, John continued his work apart from the isolated Savior and only a few of the Baptist disciples actually helped Jesus. This created confusion in the minds of both John and Jesus' followers. John separates from Jesus. Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside and baptized. John was also baptizing. John's disciples came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the one you testified about, everybody's going to him. To this John replied, he must become greater, I must become less. So, you know, this is usually interpreted as John's great humility. Oh, John is so humble. He sees Jesus becoming so great, and he is so small. <clears throat> but I ask you, if you love and serve the Messiah, do you not share in his fate? Right? If Jesus is proclaiming the message, aren't you right there with him? Aren't you participating in his victory? If Jesus is suffering and being rejected, are you not sharing in that same fate? If you are one with Christ, if you believe in Christ. And if we look at the story of Ruth in the, during the period of the judges, who is proclaimed as a virtuous woman of God, She's one of the few women, she may be the only woman in the Old Testament, I should know, um, but I don't. Is she the only woman in the Old Testament with a book dedicated to her? No, Esther. Esther, Esther she has her own chapter. Yeah. Okay, worldwide I have testified to my ignorance. Anyway, she's one of the few <laughs> women to have a book named after her. If you have a book named after you, you have to have done something good. I mentioned this last time, but it keeps coming to me. 
Um, if you want to have your name remembered in history by God, accomplish your mission on some level. Who was Lot's wife? What was her name? No idea. Who was Noah's wife? What's her name? No idea. Okay, so just word to the wise. But Ruth, we remember. She said to Naomi after her husband died, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. There was a woman of faith who was remembered today because of that heart and that attitude. But tragically, John goes his way apart from Jesus and even begins to doubt Jesus. He gets tangled up in the affairs of, of Herod's brother Philip, who took Herodias as his wife, and then gets sent to prison because of this. And then <clears throat> uh, in prison, he says to his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Is this someone who is proclaiming the coming of the Lord? You know, this is someone who had a vision and then wonders, was it really real? It shows someone who is in a state of doubt. Jesus goes his way apart, John goes his way apart from Jesus, John doubts Jesus, and John even denies that he is Elijah. He contradicts Jesus Christ when he says, they asked him, are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Jesus says, John the Baptist is Elijah. John the Baptist says, I am not. What are the people to think? Who, who are they more likely to believe? John the Baptist, who was born from uh, the high priest Zechariah, miracles surrounding his birth, or Jesus, a bastard, a child born from a woman who should have been stoned to death, who risked her life to give birth to Jesus. So we need to understand the importance, the significance of John's denial that he was in fact Elijah. And this denial was a crippling blow to the mission of Jesus. It says um, in one of the books that after the news came back to Jesus of the beheading of John the Baptist, he went off to pray to be alone with God. It was such a blow to his ministry. This made his messianic claims appear to be false and self-serving. What does Jesus say? He says, go back and report to John what you hear and see. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. What is he saying here in plain language? He is saying, John has fallen away from me. He is not supporting me. He is not blessed. And he says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and men of violence take it by force. Meaning, when the kingdom comes, it will not come peacefully because of the failure of John to proclaim me as God's son. The foundation for Jesus was lost. The entire foundation which God had prepared to help Jesus as the Messiah dissipated. The Messiah was left to find support for himself. Jesus attracted people who had little if in education or influence. Political and religious leaders felt threatened and opposed him. And his own disciples began to lose faith. Imagine the situation of Jesus. Here was a man with all embracing love who grieved over the misery of humanity, a man who understood God's heart to a depth which no one else could. Jesus felt his father's agony over the fallen world, knowing how much God and faithful people had prepared for this very moment. Yet without an object with whom to share his love and knowledge, Jesus was alone. 
Even at the Last Supper, Jesus' most intimate followers could not understand his heart, and one of them left to betray him. <clears throat> and now I want to finish by talking about Jesus' prayer not to die. We need to understand that Jesus' prayer at Gethsemane not to die was not one iota from weakness. It has sometimes been said, oh, Jesus was shown his human side by his desire not to die. No, far from any selfish concern, it was the prayer of a man desperate for his father, desperate for his followers, and for the future of his people and the world. He had no concern for himself. If dying was all he could do, he would have gladly died many times over. <clears throat> his prayer, not to die, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. My father, if it be possible, may this cup be taken away from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Tragically, with no substantial foundation to support his son, God was faced with only one recourse, because no one would sacrifice for the Messiah. The Messiah would have to sacrifice his life to pay for the failures of all humankind. Even his three closest disciples fell asleep. No one was willing to risk his life for the sake of this one true man. <clears throat> Jesus is, takes responsibility for human failure in the way of the cross. He accepts the way of death, offering his priceless life to Satan in order to protect us from the consequences of our own faithlessness. Soon after the prayer in Gethsemane, Judas came with the authorities and soldiers and identified Jesus by kissing him. One whom Jesus had loved and served for three years had betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. As Jesus was led away by the soldiers, his disciples fled for their lives. By the next morning, even his first disciple, Peter, had denied Jesus three times. Under the high priest Caiaphas and the Supreme Religious Council, Jesus was accused of heresy, blasphemy, and other violations of the law, all punishable by death. Before being sent on to the governor Pilate for, sentence, for sentencing according to Roman law, Jesus was further mocked and tormented by the very ones who were to have revered him. Ironically, when he was brought before Pilate, the Roman governor recognized his innocence. He had broken no law of the empire and therefore legally could not be executed. Pilate therefore sent Jesus to Herod, the king of Israel, but the king only ridiculed him. He said, hey, Jesus, show me some miracles. Jesus was silent. Herod returned him to the Roman auspices. Pilate was under pressure to kill the heretic Jesus, but once again the conscientious man tried to save his life. His wife had had a dream saying, do not touch this man, do not harm this man. <clears throat> Custom allowed Pilate to spare one prisoner's life on Passover, and Pilate appealed to the crowds to choose between the preacher Jesus and the murder Barabbas. Barabbas. To Pilate's dismay, the people incited by their spiritual leadership called out for the release of the criminal. Give us Barabbas, they cried. Crucify Jesus. And then in the hands of the Romans, at the assistance of the spiritual leaders of Israel, Jesus was to bear the full power of evil. He was mercilessly flogged to the point just before death. The scourging practice was a short whip with lead balls and sheep bones were tied into leather thongs, ripping the flesh off his bones. Thus the true man was driven into the street carrying as instrument of torture a great wooden cross. Heartbroken and exhausted, wearing a crown of thorns to mock his apparent impotence as king and cursed by the people from whom he had cried, Jesus bore his burden to the hill where he was to die. At Calvary, the soldiers drove nails into his hands and feet, hoisted him up to the cross along with two criminals. He was left to die a slow and miserable death. And even while he was dying, <clears throat> The men below were dividing up his garments, casting lots to decide what each man 
should take. And yet, as I said earlier, as Jesus' body was racked with pain, he was scarcely able to breathe. He spoke the words, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The Son of God, until the end, his heart had only compassion for those who were killing him. It was Jesus' pure heart that defeated Satan. Even with his final breath, he offered up his life to God, saying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And so, brothers and sisters, it was not the crucifixion, but it was Jesus' unconditional offering, his unconditional love through this ordeal that brought God's victory. At the point which we now call, now call Pentecost, Jesus and the Holy Spirit moved the disciples to launch new preparations for the return of the Messiah. And so the Messiah will come again, not to bear sin, but to bring full salvation, spiritual and physical salvation to those who are waiting for him. The Savior must return to complete the task of restoration, which means the transformation of the physical world in conformity to the purpose of creation on earth. The three blessings to substantiate the lineage of God on earth. And I would like to close by saying that I believe that Jesus Christ is totally active now in the second coming of Christ working with the Lord of the Second Advent to perpetuate God's lineage on this earth. Would you please join me in prayer? <clears throat> Our most beloved Heavenly Father, Father, I thank you so much for being able to speak these words. Father, which have come directly from your heart, how many years have you waited to speak these words, Father? We speak them so freely, having done so little to merit having been given them. But Father, we believe that we are blessing the world through the speaking of these words. Father, I pray that the truth of the, the life that mission of Jesus can quickly spread throughout the earth that those that are believing in Jesus as the Messiah can be strengthened for the time now is of much persecution where the followers of Jesus Christ are suffering for their belief but father suffering or not we will continue we will uphold the name of Christ we will uphold the name of the Son of God we rejoice that this is the time of the second coming when the mission of the Messiah can come to full fruition from the establishment of your lineage upon this earth. We thank you for this time we could share together. We offer to you in all of the names of all the blessed central families listening and in my name, Doug and Carrie Williams, the blessed central family, Aju. Thank you, brothers. God.